Welcome to the interview on the Raptors Republic Podcast Network. I'm Andrew Damelin, and if you hear this voice, you know we're discussing the Raptors 905. And today we have a really special guest by way of the Congo, by way of Belgium, by way of Metro State and the Toronto Raptors. And now he is the Raptors 905 head coach, Patrick Mutombo. Patrick, how are you? I'm well, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this. And what's amazing is this is the first time I'm actually talking to you, not face to face, literally, but with you not having a mask on. So it's, it's, it's like this whole different experience. You're smiling. I've never seen your teeth before. So like, hopefully this is a less formal uh, interaction. And um, we were, we were talking before we got on the air about your, your, uh, you got home a couple of weeks ago and you've been in quarantine. So I'm wondering how much NBA are, are you watching uh, in these last two and a half weeks? Are you settling back as a fan or are you still in that sort of coach mindset as you're watching the NBA? Man, Andrew, I don't know if I would ever, well, I guess I can settle back as a fan, but no, I've been watching a lot of, uh, a lot of NBA, man, a lot of NBA ball. And sometimes I have to remind myself to unplug and, and maybe watch a movie with my wife. It feels like doing it, but yeah, I've been watching a lot of basketball. Is there like a league pass team you have, like a team that's on maybe late that you're just so excited to watch? For me, it's it's New Orleans and Zion. Like I just love watching them every night. Is there a team that you really gravitated towards that you just really enjoy watching these days? Uh, not, I mean, other than the Raptors, not really. I'm I'm because I'm, I'm always you know haven't been in the league for a little bit now, and I have friends on different staffs, and I have players that I've coached in the past, so I'm kind of just. I try to keep my eyes on, on, on everybody, and but I'm also curious to see what coaches are doing, how they're attacking certain schemes, and always trying to see where the game is going. And you know, now that you're a G League head coach, you're you're a razor of role players. You're not a razor of someone that's going to be a star, unless you're Pascal Siakam, the one exception. Is there a role player, whether maybe it was when you were with the Nuggets or even now as you're watching the NBA, is there a role player or two that comes to mind where you're like, that guy fits in so seamlessly, I could, I could put him in anywhere. Is there a player you're a particular fan of that's not necessarily a star? Oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a good question. Well, a lot of, when, when you think about it, Andrew, there's more, there were more role players than stars, really. So when I watch games, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily have one player. I think that, oh man, I can fit him here. But I'm thinking about, okay, that guy's role, you know, such and such on our team could play that role. You know, mm-hmm. this guy could be plugged into this type of, of role, a defensive specialist, you know, or man, this guy's a good player that could fit perfectly in this scheme. Yeah, that's, that's the type of stuff I think about. So, so that's where your mindset is at now. You're, you're an NBA coach. Um, I, I kind of want to go back to the, maybe not the beginning, beginning, but close to the beginning. Is there a memory you have, whether it's when you were in the Congo growing up or in Belgium when you moved, when you were around 12 or 13 years old, is there a, a first memory you have of watching the NBA and, and a player or team that you, that you gravitated towards? Well, first of all, Andrew, I got to give you props, man. You, you went back and you did your homework. I mean, you... <laughs> I mean, you did your homework. You you know where I'm from and when I moved to Belgium and all that. So I definitely appreciate it. Andrew, it's funny because when my family moved to Belgium, my family moved to Belgium, I was 13. And, uh, you know, I didn't know much about the NBA other than what I heard people say. You know, we, you know, we didn't really have access to NBA games. So I would have an uncle uh, record games for me. And, and uh, so that's how I would watch the games and they would give them to me. And I watched the same tape over and over and over. Like I remember watching the Mike, Michael Jordan uh, uh, finals, you know, and just watch them over and over. And that's, that's my earliest memory of really watching something that stuck with me. I don't even remember, remember I don't even remember the years. Uh, I remember the finals, but before that there was, other games also that I used to watch, but that's like, and then my first game, my first NBA game ever was on a recruiting visit to Metro State. And uh, this friend of mine, uh, Fred, uh, Fred Young, who's a missionary, but also run an organization called Form of Sport, help in Belgium helps students uh, find colleges in, in the US. And he, he took us after our visit, took us to a, uh, to a Denver Nuggets game, and it was Nuggets against Seattle. 
And we were way up there, Andrew, way up there. And I remember just watching Gary Payton. And the one thing that impressed me about him is how low he would get on his stance. And that's my first experience with, with watching a real NBA game live. That's awesome. So that would have been, you're 18, 19 years old. Was Sean, was, Sean, was Sean Kemp still on those teams or had he moved on to Cleveland at that point? Man, I don't remember Sean Kemp. I just remember Gary Payton. He might, but I don't I don't remember Sean Kemp. And it's far, but I, I just remember Gary Payton. That's pretty amazing synergy, given that you coached Gary Payton the second some, something now some that 20 years later. I never, I never really thought of it like, that way, yeah. No, that, that's incredible. And, and we'll, we'll get to, to your team. Um, but, you know, so you, you go to Metro State, you win two division titles. You're, you're obviously have aspirations to make the NBA. You end up having a uh, overseas career in Italy, Greece. Uh, you had a, a brief stint in the D league as well. Um, and, but everyone has their um, overseas basketball horror story. Um, they're just, you're, you're smiling right now. Is there, is there, is there a story that comes to mind when, when you think of that, when you think oh, of that, God. when you're asked about that, yeah, man, plenty of stories. <laughs> one, played, one that you can say on this podcast. Yeah, well, I played in I played in Greece, man. I, you know, I was injured for a while, and I came because I, I I spent most of my career in Italy, first division Italy, and then I got hurt, uh, and then I went to A two, and then we won, we won the league in A two, went back to the uh, uh, to first division, but then I signed with a team in Greece, and Greece was a different league for me, and and. It was notorious for being unprofessional and not paying people. So, but what I needed to play. So I went there, Andrew, nothing of what was promised to me was given. <laughs> From the money, the apartment, the car, I ended up catching the bus. At the end of the season, I ended up catching the bus out of uh, the place where I was and to find my way back home. And, you know, and, and it's customary for teams to at least arrange rides and, and plane tickets and, you know, take somebody all the way to the airport and that kind of stuff. I figure out my way. So that was, listen, <laughs> the, the people were great. <laughs> the food was great. The experience was horrible. Now, that may be true, uh, but you'd have one very positive experience while you were in Italy uh, is you, you found a mentor in terms of art. Um, yeah. and people talk about, um, Patrick Redembo as artist, like as if Nick Nurse and the, and the guitar is comparable. It's like, no, this isn't a hobby like, like it is for Nick Nurse and guitar. This is a, in guitar, this is a real thing, thing for you. Right. And, um, you talk about studying proportions and colors and Van Gogh and impressionism and, uh, and, and the like, what drew you to that form of expression? So, so little correction that happened in Greece. 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 And no, that's all right. That's all right. That's quite all right. And it's funny because it's out, Andrew, I was going through that horrible basketball experience. But yet, that's when I found, uh, I think, something that lay dormant in me. And one attracted me to it. One is, well, I just find it, I found something that, that, that just gave me joy again. Cause I was miserable playing the game because I'm, I'm a very principled man. And I go, I, you know, I, I like that. Listen, if we shake hands and, and I sign a contract and you got to do the best you can to honor your contract. And if the contract is not being honored and there's just no remorse. And I wasn't the only person in that situation, by the way, on that team. So it was just like the, the anger, the frustration. And when, so when I found art and then my, when I went, when I met my, my good friend Labros, and I just started painting and I just immersed myself in it. You know, a lot of sleepless nights, just studying colors and all those different things and getting my references and bringing the work to him for him to correct. It sort of became the main thing. Andrew, it became, it became the main thing. And, and from there, I never looked back. And you talk about um, the studying, the, the obsession. You've mentioned basketball as an obsession. You want to be great. It has to become an obsession. And obviously art uh, became that for you. And, and one, one thing you also said that was interesting is you said so often you start out with an art project, you, you mean it to be one thing. And at the end of this whole process, it's something completely different. And you actually liken it to basketball. And yeah. I was wondering, is there a basketball player that comes to mind? Because you're, you know, you're originally a development coach. 
Is there a coach that you, is there a player you worked with that you may have thought was going to be one thing? And then it turns out at the uh, end of his development process, he turned into something beautiful, as you say, but, but so much different than what you might have expected. Yeah. I mean, I'll go, I'll look at Pascal and I'll look at Fred, you know, you know, working with, working with Fred in particular, just, you know, you was, a, you know, he was a solid player. He, you know, he's not a mistake player. I had no idea he would become this good. You know, where, I mean, his leadership, and, and I think it's just people are just realizing the type of leader he is. I always tell them, listen, uh, when you're done at some point, I want you to come and, and be one of my assistants. You know, hopefully by then I'm, you know, I'm a, not in the G League <laughs> and I'm coaching, you know, in, in the big league. Uh, but he's just, he's just so smart, so good. When we started out, you know, I didn't, I would lie if I said I, I anticipated him being a starter and, uh, and, and, and doing all the marvelous things he's doing now. You know, that's just one example. I liken it to art. art. You start with an idea you think, you know, and that's why, that's why it's a very, very humbling. If I'm honest with you, Andrew, it's very humbling because, you know, as coaches, sometimes we think we know, right? We think we, we have all the answers, but you really don't. And, and, and a lot of coaches before us have touched this kid and planted some seeds. And then we come and we plant some seeds. And then some people behind me will plant some seeds. And, and what's in him comes out. Who are we to take credit? Yeah. Did you see, I assume you watched last night's game against Detroit? Did you see the game was obviously well out of hand? And I think Chris Boucher, he either had a big block or an, it was a big block, I believe. You, you saw him cheering from the sidelines, like with the game. Did that, yeah, that, and that type of thing fake. resonates. It's not fake. Like he's, he's, he's real. We're still, you know, we're still in contact. And, and I know if there's one guy I can go to war with, there'll be that guy. And, in my and just, just one last thing about the art. I know you, you um, <clears throat> excuse me, you painted um, a Thelonious Monk painting for, for Nick Nurse. Are you, are you a jazz aficionado or is that just for Coach Nurse? I'm not, you know, I was in my studio. I was in my studio one day. I remember it's funny because I was in my studio. I was painting, lo and behold. And then I get a text from Nick. Hey, he sends me a picture. Say, you know, what do you think of this picture? Oh, cool picture. And then he goes, can you paint it? I said, I give it a try. Then I brought it to him the next day. Mm. It's like, whoa! It was his reaction. His, rea his reaction was cool because he didn't think I was going to paint it. And then I changed a few things in the picture. Uh, and 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 yeah, but I'm not a I'm not a jazz guy. I'll listen to it some, but that was just something for him. I thought it would be be a cool gesture. Yeah, and no, I'm sure I'm sure he enjoyed it. Um, and uh, you know, I want I want to continue on uh, in your career. You you move past the the your playing days. You're an assistant on Denver, and uh, you had some interesting guys uh, on that team. My my first question to you is: Was Kenneth Fareed Alize Johnson before Alize Johnson? Ooh, that's a good comparison. That's a good comparison. I'll say Kenneth Fareed M Motor is a little bit higher than Alize, but then Alize has a more polished offensive game. Okay, so. Fair and um, you, in comparison, comparing both. Yeah. Sure, and and also on, along the same Johnson line, you, you praised him for for the swagger he had, and I made up an all Denver Nuggets swagger team, and I, I wanted to see what your thoughts were on them. Okay, so during your time with the Nuggets, yeah. I got Wilson Chandler, yes. Al Harrington, Andre Miller, Andre Iguodala, and maybe this is crazy. Rudy Fernandez. Now, what do you, what do you, oh, um, Patrick is, was clapping for everybody who's, who's listening. So tell me how that swaggerness sort of resonates with those, with those selections that I gave you. That's pretty, pretty, pretty spot on. There's a couple people that I've made, I made trade in and out. Okay. Uh, I think a guy that's, that is a, that has an understated swagger is still playing now. Is Gallinari. Mm. He's got that. He's got that. Hey, I'm Italian. I've played. I've been playing since I was 15. This is nothing to me. And I don't have to exude too much effort. Yeah, he Just is smooth. Watch. He is very yeah, smooth. Yeah, exactly. 
you know, so it'll drive you crazy as a coach at times until he gives you, he gives you 30 points and he, he shoots 12 free throws and has nine assists, you know, without looking like he's not trying. And then three charges. Charges, yeah, that's rare. That's rare for, for Dude Lowy. <laughs> I'd like to go back. I'd like to go back and find a tape of him taking charges, but uh, but yeah. No, no, he did. Like he, he's a. You go back, you'll see. Those years, those years I coached him, he took a lot of charges, especially for six ten guys. He was very smart with his angles and all that. But but you're right, Andrew Miller. Andrew Miller, yes, smart man, swag, just knew the game, understood the game. Al Harrington, man, you want to go to bat with that guy. You want to go to bat. I mean, that guy is just, he's not going to back down. Super ultra confident, loves the game, incredible human being. And you know? the, he's, a, he's a guy that, will, that he won't back down, but he will back you down. Uh, in the post, right? And, oh, yeah, yeah. No, no question. No and, question. And, um, you know, Alizé Johnson, also a guy that's going to back you down. And it was so interesting to me. You, know, you guys had the number one offense in the league, and yet you went to this arcane thing called the post-up. And, um, I, you know, I was wondering, leaving aside that it's optimal to shoot a ton of threes, what is your sort of ideal basketball aesthetic? Is it like the back down game from the nineties and the centers dominating things, or is it today's game where it's really free, free flowing and a huge emphasis on shooting the three? My truth, Andrew is somewhere in the middle, right? It's somewhere in the middle. I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to put myself in the prison of just, just threes because at some point, like I told our team initially, they looked at me crazy. I said, listen, Mental toughness is getting into somebody's paint and scoring in there time and time and time and time again. It's almost there's something that's humiliating for a coach when you're giving up layups. I think, I think, at least that's how I felt, right? So going in there, and it's hard to get into the paint, but it should be hard, right? And, and that's mental toughness. So that's one. And then and then the team is going to react. Then the three ball is going to be there. Because I think, really, you can get a three ball almost any time. Any time. So why settle? It's like when you walk into a store, Andrew, and you buy that first item you see. Why? Take the time, explore, get in there, see. Maybe the clearance rack is in the back there. See if you can get something. And, and that's kind of, so to me, it's go get a layup open the floor, give yourself chances and opportunity to get the layup. If that's not there, then we go to something else. And the post-up is part of it too, you know? So you asked me what my ideal is. My ideal is finding what our players do well and maximize it, but tell them what are the high percentage shots their talent should give us, should provide for us. You mentioned hammering away at that message to the team. And we only found out sort of, as the playoffs went on that in the early part of the season, there may have been some friction in getting that message across. Is there, and maybe that's an understatement. Um, is there um, a time during the season where you felt like the message really is getting through? My, my thought was it was maybe during the Memphis hustle game when you gave up a big lead and ended up hanging on and then ripped off eight straight. But I was just wondering, was there a time where you felt like, okay, these guys are actually getting it. Oh, man. And you know, Andrew, some some high coaches will find a way to torture ourselves. And, and you know, my first time, I kind of just had to kind of stop. And, and I felt, I, I don't know exactly when I felt like the team was getting it. Um, I thought the staff did a good enough job to keep emphasizing the message because this one thing about players, you tell them, they'll say yes until it stops working. And then they'll try to find allies with your coaches, somebody who will side with them and kind of have a mutiny and then, and then kind of sort of have a coup and change the kudos to our staff because nobody gave in. And this is what we we're doing. And when they realized that we weren't budging, I feel like that's when they kind of just let go and embraced it because we weren't going anywhere and nothing was changing. This is how we were going to play. And at the end, they all embraced it in a way that I thought, like a painting, came out very nice. Too bad we didn't win it, because that would have been the icing on the, 
on a cake. Yeah, you came up just short, obviously, in the in the semifinal. <laughs> you know, you mentioned your team not budging, your coaching staff not budging, and I imagine throughout your experience as an assistant coach, you've been that that uh, potential ally that a player has possibly gone to. Uh, it must be super difficult. So to, to stick with that mindset is, is, is impressive. And, um, you know, Jerry Stackhouse once said, who was also an assistant with the Raptors and a head coach of the 905, he said, what he really enjoyed about going from assistants to head coaches as the assistant, you make suggestions as the head coach, you make decisions. How did you find that transition from suggestion maker to decision maker? Andrew was great. I think, I think that's one of the privileges of the position of the seat. Right, because uh, if you are studied uh, and 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 you prepare and you work on your stuff, when you finally get, because here's what happens, Andrew, all these assistant coaches that you see have a thousand suggestions and, and a thousand ideas. Well, I would do this. Well, how come we're not doing this this way? Well, you know, and you got all these things you want to suggest because you got all these ideas. You just can't wait to experiment. Right. And you think they're the best in the world. And then you get thrown into that chair. It's like, okay, now you get to make a decision. And then you realize, oh, I don't need a thousand suggestions. Because I have my ideas. I need people that will help me execute those. But then people that would also bring me ideas, but they are not distracting to what we're trying to do, you know, because. An analogy I like to, uh, to bring is eight plus two equals 10, but so does seven plus one plus one plus one. So does five plus four plus one. But right now it's eight plus 10. This is what we're doing. And so no, don't bring me your four plus one plus one <laughs> plus one, you know, and that's kind of, and I've learned that and, and I've enjoyed the process of, okay, so you have your ideas, but then you're also working with competent assistants who have good ideas and you need to honor their ideas. You need to honor their craft and their preparation. And how do you make it all work without a wasting time, getting distracted, compromising your beliefs and all that. So I really enjoy juggling all that. I'm glad you enjoyed it because I couldn't tell that you were enjoying it uh, at any point uh, during the season. You know, you, you cut a very serious demeanor. You're obviously a very serious person. You talk about obsession. And I remember you know, after the first press conference, whenever I'd be called on to unmute myself, I'd be like, okay, just be prepared. He's very serious. Just press the, get the, get the wording correctly. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be okay. Right. So you're very serious about things. And, and but another thing you're, you're, you, you, have, you have this softer side as well. You, you mentioned your wife and your family all, all the time and how supportive they've right. been. How, how much of a, of a sort of balancing force uh, has your wife been in, in, in helping you along in this journey? Oh, tremendous. Andrew is, uh, well, my wife is the first person who told me, dude, you look, people don't know you. They'll think you are the standoffish. You know, you, you need to learn how to just relax your face a little bit. You know, she so she she just told me that. I, listen, I was I was having a ball, enjoying enjoying coaching, enjoying that experience. But there's something about Andrew. I don't know, but uh, I've never seen anybody win at a high level by being casual and kind of. I haven't seen it. Most competitors that I've been around have a. Uh, a seriousness about them. And mine, unfortunately, is, is just kind of natural the way I, I'm, I'm, I'm built. But having my wife and my children, you know, always help me, helps me put things into perspective, right? Like my wife told me, dude, like technical, no, we're not doing that. So I kid you not, I had to think about it during the game. There's times where I, I was getting ready to lose it. I remember my wife telling me, you know, we're not doing technicals because why are we telling our children about self-control? All right. Well, mama said, <laughs> no I got two. You know, I failed. But, but, but that's, again, that's my wife being supportive and she, she wants me to do well. And, and she said, hey, you know, you don't want to be looked at as a guy that constantly berates officials and complains all the time. It's a small thing, but that actually came from my wife telling me. 
So TSC is huge. Yeah, no, that's it, it's it. As soon as you said that you mentioned your wife and your kids, I was like, okay, this guy, I, I'm going to relate to him at least on some level because that's the same type of force that I get from from my wife and, and my kids as well. So uh, I'll get I'll get and I'll get you out of here on this one. I, I really appreciate it. In, in a similar vein of being true to yourself, um, excuse me. <clears throat> Last night, uh, Dwayne Casey was asked about coaching OG and Anobi, and he says, you know, OG just plays with a pure heart. And you mentioned coaching with a pure heart uh, a few times during uh, the G League bubble. What what does it mean to coach with a pure heart? Man, Andrew, like I could talk about this for days. Uh, to me, coaching with a pure heart is, you know, we we are put in this position, right? There's a lot of responsibility. Andrew, I sat there before the season and, and I looked at our, our players. The first thing I told them is that I respected each one of them because they are chasing something. They are hopeful. And I've been in their position. I didn't make it. I wasn't good enough. But I tried. Right? And here they are. They are trying. And the way I look at it, now somebody said, all right, so you got these 12 guys. They all have a dream. And you are responsible to help them reach that dream. Man, that's a responsibility. And, and so when you saw me at the games and and, and kind of just that, that series, because I, that was in the forefront of my mind. Like, how do I get this guy to get to his next opportunity? Knowing that the people who are watching him won't go for what he's doing now. They don't know, but I know. How do I help him without killing his joy, without breaking his spirit? How do I do that? And to me, just staying true to that calling, staying true to that responsibility. To me, that's what it meant, coaching with a pure heart. You know, it wasn't about, I don't know if there was, there's anything else. You know, for me, it's, you know, I'm here and I'm, you know, and I'm, a, I'm a Christian. And, and, and I feel like I have a responsibility before God that these guys were put into my care and to, to be taken care of, to be led. And it's, a, it's, it's heavy, man, because I got to care for them, not only as basketball players, but souls. They're not just pawns that, oh, he's not good enough, so I'm not going to talk to him. I'm not going to coach him. I have to coach him. I have to love on him. I have to help him on the court, off the court, help him be a better husband, a better father, a better friend. A better basketball player, that's a lot, man. And to me, if I keep those things before my eyes, uh, that's that's what it means to coach with a pure heart, as far as I'm concerned. Well, that's a beautiful way of putting it. Uh, another quote I had from you that's very simple as well. I'm, I'm on earth to do something, and I have a purpose. And it seems like you're, you're living out that purpose. Um, so, Coach Matumbo, we, we really appreciate the time that you took today. Hopefully, at some point down the road, we will actually meet in person, uh, chop it up a little bit, and yeah. um, and hopefully, you know, you enjoy the rest of the spring and the weather gets gets better and and the family stays well. Thanks, Coach. Andrew, thank you, thank you so much, man. Thank you for having me, and, and this is great. I had a I had a great time, and I look forward to seeing you. And you will see Andrew. I think I'm a fun guy. I think I think I'm a fun guy most days. That sounds great, Coach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. 